Jimmy Spoon and the Pony Express, seven, a lonely birthday. Jimmy could see that the Paiutes heading east had ridden around the north side of the butte. He galloped south through a sandy arroyo, then up onto a trail that looked like a long piece of string stretching through the sagebrush. Soon enough, he saw the dust of many horses to his left, their riders hidden by the powdery alkali that rose from the trail. Alkali, sorry that rose from the trail. Jimmy could tell he was gaining on them, even though his path was rough with weeds and burrows. By the time the Indians saw Jimmy, he had passed them and had made it through Shadow Canyon. Now he was closing in on Ruby Valley Station, the mochila still safe underneath him. He felt sorry to be pushing his horse so hard, and most of all, he was sorry these Indians believed he was an enemy. With the setting sun at his back, Jimmy's shadow spilled in front of him like a long stain. He looked over his shoulder and was surprised to see the dust moving north. Perhaps it was the approaching darkness that turned his pursuers homeward, or perhaps they knew soldiers were close. An hour and a half later, leaving Sulphur Creek, he saw the cabin and Milo leaning a relief ho leading a relief horse from the corral. Moments later, Jimmy dismounted and tossed over the mochila. He wished he were the one continuing to Salt Lake City instead of young Nick Cone. On a warm afternoon, on the warm afternoon of May seventh. Captain Zimmerman rode in with bad news. While his soldiers watered their horses, he cussed about the Indians. Bad enough about Sulphur Creek, but now William's station there on Carson River. It was burned to the ground, he reported. His sunburned face looked angry. Oscar and David Williams were killed, along with three of their men. Cold Spring Station. Sure, it's 200 miles from here, but it's still our front yard, far as I'm concerned. It was burned, too. The boss and the stable boys scalped. Those savages are dangerous. Worse than hornets stirred up. The captain's saddle creaked as he stepped onto the stirrup and pulled himself up. His dark blue uniform was dusty. He swigged from his canteen, then, with water dripping from his chin, yelled for all to hear. Until further notice, notice, pony riders are to stay put. No relays. Got to rebuild stations and bring in more horses, more men. The army will escort an overland stage now and then, but otherwise trails closed. Shut down. Jimmy was worried. Sir? He said, shading his eyes to look up. What if Paiutes come after us? What'll we do? Sonny, you can shine your shoes if you want, but me, I'd keep those guns loaded with an eye wide open. Good day. With a crisp salute, he cantered toward the corral where his soldiers were mounting. Marks chiseled on the wall, told Jimmy it was May 13th, his birthday. He looked around the cluttered room at the messy beds and plates of yesterday's food. A rustle among the sacks of flour and potatoes meant desert rats had moved in and were helping themselves. Things were not turning out the way he had planned. One week had passed since his last ride and the trail was still closed. His father's store would be more interesting than this lonely way station. He didn't like being afraid of Indians or that they were considered enemies. He didn't like how Captain Zimmerman said he had to shoot first, ask questions later. What would... What would Washake think of Dawi taking orders from such a man? These things confused Jimmy and filled him with doubts. Maybe he shouldn't try to find his Shoshone friends. Maybe he had let too much time pass and they'd forgotten him, or maybe they no longer cared. Jimmy felt sad. He peered out the low doorway where he could see Will and Mr. Tag riding the perimeter in the hot sun. Flowering sagebrush made the desert look golden, and in the sky, clouds plumed like towers of cotton. It was a lovely, peaceful day, which made Jimmy yearn for the excitement of the trail, something to perk him up. No one at Ruby Valley knew it was his birthday, so there would be no cake or presents. Jimmy felt comforted knowing his parents were thinking of him, and when he realized he was now 18 years old, he felt even better. This calls for a swim, that's what. At the springs, he peeled off his shirt and trousers. He dunked them a few times, wrung them out, then draped them over boulders to dry. While he floated on his back, he watched clouds drift across the turquoise sky. A red-tailed hawk circled overhead in the still air. Driving from Jimmy's, diving from Jimmy's sight, then rising again with a small f furry creature in its talons. For a moment, he forgot about being lonesome. A pleasant memory made him smile. It had been a warm day like this along the river. Teepees stood in the shade of cottonwood trees, and cooking fires filled the air with wood smoke. Jimmy had been chasing another boy above the waterfall, where he saw before him a pool of deep and crystal clear. Nahani was bathing with her friends. He knew he shouldn't watch, but he couldn't help himself. She was she was beautiful, the graceful way she braided her wet hair. He was surprised this memory made him ache. For days now, he had watched the wide sky and listened as the wind rustled. 
and listened as wind rustled the desert grass. He'd sat so still for so long, a yellow-backed spiny, spiny lizard had taken a nap on, his, on the toe of his boot. Jimmy gazed at the northern trails, hoping to see some of his old friends on a hunt or gathering canis roots, but the trails were empty. Perhaps it was no longer safe for them to come this far south. Jimmy missed the way of the Shoshone. He yearned to be with Nahani, to laugh with her again and watch, the, and watch eagles nesting. If she and the others would not be traveling to Ruby Valley, should Jimmy try to look for them anyway? Could he bear to know they might have forgotten him? And that is the end of chapter 7.